Chapter 4 Dryden stared out through the boughs of a cedar at the edge of a small park. He and Rachel had traveled only three blocks from the yard they'd first hidden in. They were still deep inside the residential back streets of El Cedero, with Rachel's pursuers everywhere. Within sixty seconds of the last radio transmission, the rest of the men had filtered into the neighborhood like shadows. When they wanted to be quiet, they were good at it. They'd also stowed their flashlights, making it much harder to pinpoint their locations. Each time Dryden had led Rachel from one piece of cover to the next, he'd studied the open ground for at least a minute first. Even at that, they'd been lucky to make it this far. These people had elite training in their backgrounds. Dryden could see it in the moves they made and didn't make. No wasted motion. Nothing extraneous. He'd had the same principles drilled into him years before. He studied the park. One side butted up against a row of backyards, another lay open to the street. As he watched, a silhouette passed through the space between the jungle gym and the swing set, forty yards away. Dryden turned his attention toward the adjacent homes. They lay east of where he and Rachel were hiding, inland, away from the sea. The plan, so far as he had one, was to move in that direction into the broad commercial district across the interstate. If nothing else, that part of town was much larger, with storefronts and warehouses and industrial lots. Easier to hide in. Harder to seek in. The plan could evolve from there. The man in the park slipped away to the street, crossed it, and vanished into the shadows between houses on the far side. Dryden turned the other way again, scrutinizing the open ground between the cedar shrub and the east side row of homes. The distance he and Rachel would have to cross was seventy feet, give or take. It lay mostly in darkness, but there was no cover at all. Anyone watching might see them, once they went for it. He gave the street and the yards beyond one last survey. No one moving. No one there at all, that he could see. He was already holding Rachel's hand. He turned to her and nodded in the direction they would run. She nodded back, scared but ready. Dryden was tensing to move when she squeezed his hand sharply, a convulsive action that could only be a warning. He didn't even look toward her. He didn't move at all. He held dead still and took quiet breaths through his mouth. Three seconds later, a man passed in front of the cedar shrub, less than ten feet from where they crouched. He'd come from behind and to the side, his approach hidden by the bush itself. His footsteps were entirely silent on the damp grass. Even now, watching each step, Dryden could hear nothing. How Rachel had detected him, he couldn't imagine. She was maybe three feet closer to where the guy had appeared from, and kids' ears tended to be better than those of grown-ups, but for all that, her senses had to be unreal. Dryden waited. The man moved deeper into the park. He stopped there and turned a slow circle, briefly swinging his gaze past the place where Dryden and Rachel were hiding. It occurred to Dryden that only the sheer number of such shrubs, hundreds throughout the park and the surrounding blocks, prevented the searchers from systematically checking them all. They were watching open ground for movement instead. The guy finished his sweep and moved on, following the same path as the man before him. When he'd gone, Dryden scanned the street again. Empty. At least as empty as it had seemed before. He looked at Rachel. She nodded, ready as ever. They ran. They didn't stop running until nearly ten minutes later. When Rachel slowed five minutes in, Dryden picked her up and kept going at almost full speed. He only stopped when they reached the top of an embankment high above the freeway. He was winded and felt a vague headache at his temples, not quite pain, but a kind of chill. Whatever it was, it meant he'd slipped a bit since his prime. Back in his days in the unit, he'd routinely knocked out ten-mile runs hauling gear that weighed as much as Rachel. He recovered enough to breathe quietly and listen to the night around them. Above the whisper of traffic sparse at this hour, he strained for what he hoped he wouldn't hear. A helicopter. Someone who could assemble a team of men with silenced machine guns and was brazen enough to deploy them on civilian streets might be able to call in other resources. A chopper with a thermal camera would spot him and the girl as easily as if they were glowing. Dryden listened for twenty seconds longer but heard nothing. It didn't mean they were in the clear. He stared across the freeway toward the commercial and industrial parts of town. Chopper or no chopper, they still had to hide. He was about to start down the embankment when something stopped him, an instinctive impulse deep in his mind, like the feel of the hair on his neck standing taut. A response to a threat. But what threat? He held still and listened again. 
there was no sound but the traffic. He scanned the darkness and saw nothing. The fear hadn't come from anything he'd seen or heard. It had only been a thought just below conscious awareness, some sense of an extra wrinkle in the danger they faced. What was it? He waited, but the idea stayed out of reach. All that came to him was a sudden conviction. Hiding in El Cedero was the wrong move. Rachel watched him. Her eyes were full of concern, though she said nothing. Dryden nodded across the interstate. Beyond the trees on the far side, a quarter mile away, the lights of a 24-hour superstore shone in the humidity. Time to go, he said. The computer room, one level below Gall's office, was lit only by the glow of its plasma monitors, nine in all. Gall paced while his chief technical officer, Lowry, prepped them for the image streams from the Miranda satellites. There was no actual image data coming down yet, just blank screens configured and waiting. Gall had yet to receive access to the birds, and every additional minute of delay made his pulse louder in his ears. Signature's locked, Lowry said. Ready whenever we get the streams. The Mirandas were the most impressive machines humans had ever put into orbit. Their thermal imaging capability was ten years ahead of what even the most optimistic science journalists supposed it was. A Miranda could distinguish a fat man from a skinny man anywhere on Earth, day or night. Although that wasn't what made them special. Lots of spy birds could do that. The difference was that a Miranda could do it from an orbit 15 times higher. 2,000 miles up instead of the standard 130 for most recon platforms. That meant each one of them had a very wide area in which to hunt. The full constellation of Mirandas had overlapping coverage of the entire planet at all times, like the GPS network. The system could watch any spot on Earth at any moment from at least three satellites and often four or five. It could lock onto a moving target, whether it was a jogger or a cruise missile, and follow it with ease. There was nowhere to run from it, and sure as hell nowhere to hide. Of course, you had to find your target before you could follow it. Gall would only be able to spot Rachel and her new friend if they were still on foot in the countryside around El Cedero by the time he got access to the Mirandas, and every second he had to wait, that window of opportunity slipped closer to shut. Suddenly, message boxes bloomed on all nine of the monitors. Lowry snapped to attention. A second later, Gall's phone rang. He answered, They're all yours, the man on the line said. Dryden and Rachel reached the edge of the superstore's lot at a run and stopped to survey the scattered cars parked there. Most were clustered at the front of the building, probably belonging to the store's third-shift employees, but a handful were parked out at the periphery. Maybe they'd been left there by workers pulling a double shift, who'd arrived last evening when the lot was full. Dryden led the way to the nearest of the outlying vehicles, a dark green Taurus. The more commonplace the model, the better. Anything they took would be reported stolen within hours, and Rachel's pursuers had access to police communications. Blending in would be critical. Dryden gave the Taurus only a passing consideration, however, because it was new enough that it almost certainly had a smart key. It couldn't simply be hot-wired. They moved on, skirting the rim of the lot toward the next group of vehicles forty yards away. Lowry muttered his thoughts aloud as he entered commands to target the satellites. Number twelve, frame at three by three kilometers. Number fifteen, slave to twelve, index outdoor biologics, human. Number four, slave to twelve, ditto command. Complimenting the Miranda's remarkable hardware was a software suite right out of a conspiracy theorist's worst nightmare. A Miranda could be instructed to canvas an area the size of a town and isolate all human figures who were not inside man-made structures. One satellite could count the targets in a wide frame, while another two or three could set to work zooming in on each of them for close-up shots. Throughout the process, the birds could communicate with one another so as to efficiently divide up the workload. The whole operation would take less than 30 seconds. It was already underway. On the first monitor was the wide frame of the town, the land and ocean showing up as cool black. Sharp points of bluish-white light indicated homes and other heat sources. On the next three monitors, still frames began to pop up, the tight snapshots of human targets coming in from the other satellites. The first image showed a group of people encircling a super-bright thermal source. Beach campfire... Lowry said. Tell it to ignore? Gall nodded. Lowry instructed the system to disregard that target. Other snaps showed Kern's team rendezvousing with him at the van. 
Gall had ordered them back to it moments earlier so they could move on Rachel and Dryden as soon as their location was available. As more still shots came in, a woman walking a dog, a tall man taking out the trash, it became apparent that the Mirandas were choosing their targets in a progression from west to east. In this case, it meant they'd start at the shore and proceeded inland, probably a default setting of the software. Gaul stared at the monitor showing the wide image of the town. It extended about a mile and a half in from the coast to some kind of shopping center on the far right. The Mirandas had now indexed all of the outdoor targets on the left half and would have the right side finished in another 10 to 15 seconds. There was only one vehicle in the outer reaches of the lot worth considering. Dryden settled on it even before getting close enough to know whether it was locked. It was a Ford F-150 pickup from the early 90s, possibly the 80s. It would have nothing in the ignition but copper wires and insulation. He found the driver's door locked, no surprise there, but ducking to look through the cab, saw that the passenger side was not. Rachel, running ten feet behind him, understood. She diverted to the passenger side, got in, and reached across to open Dryden's door. He slid in behind the wheel. 2,031 miles above the Rockies, fleeing southeast toward the Gulf of Mexico at just under four miles per second. Miranda 15 kept its lens platform pointed at El Sidero and snapped rapid-fire shots of the human targets on its list. Target 7. Captured and sent. Target 8. Captured and sent. Target 9. The onboard computer faltered. There was no Target 9 at the stated location. Miranda 15 automatically communicated this error to Miranda 12, the satellite running the master frame and assigning targets. Miranda 12 replied that Target 9 had vanished 2.315 seconds earlier. There was no longer a signature of two human beings outdoors at that location, but instead a signature of two human beings inside a vehicle, 99.103% likely to be a Ford Model F-150 manufactured in 1988. The last command string from the operator had specified only human targets outdoors, Therefore, Target 9 was no longer valid. Miranda 15 considered this dilemma for 485 nanoseconds, the time required to run all three of its what-if algorithms, and determined that this was not a problem the human operator needed to be troubled with. It ignored Target 9 and moved on. Dryden found a screwdriver in the truck's glove box. He used it to crack open the ignition housing. It took only a few seconds more to hotwire the vehicle. Not stealing... Dryden said. Borrowing. It's pretty old, Rachel said. How upset can they be? Dryden pulled out of the lot and turned left. Just ahead lay the southbound on-ramp to the 101. Rachel looked back at the town's lights, diffused in the mist, and exhaled deeply. Let's hear the rest of your story, Dryden said. Gaul stared at the completed batch of satellite snaps like a man staring at a slot machine on which he'd lost his last dollar. Fourteen human beings were outdoors in the target area. None of them were children. She was gone. Lowry was already retargeting a wider search frame, but Gaul had no hope for it. The first frame had covered as much area as anyone on foot could have gone in the time allowed. Their absence meant they'd found transportation. Gaul sat in a chair and rested his forehead on his hands. Rachel, out of his reach, out there in the world... She couldn't remember anything important, but that was only temporary. With the drug out of her system, her memory would begin stitching itself back together within a week. Soon enough after that, she'd remember everything. The taste in his mouth thickened. For a few seconds, he was back in Boston in that shitty little flat on West 9th Street, waiting for the day the police would knock on his door. Sir? Lowry said. What is it? One of the Hail Mary processes might give us something. Gall raised his head. On the first computer, Lowry had run an option. Actually, he'd simply agreed to an option the program had recommended. The software suite had drawn the same conclusion as Gall. Failure to locate someone on foot probably meant they'd found a vehicle. Part of the latest software bundle, Lowry said. Sometimes there are heat trails on pavement if a vehicle has just left the search area. It'd be pretty faint. But the Mirandas can turn up their sensitivity and detect the heat for up to 60 seconds, depending on how fast the vehicle was going. If anyone drove out of the area recently, we might get lucky. The wide image of El Sidero remained motionless while the satellites carried out the new task. Suddenly, the image reframed to tighten on the right side a close-up of the shopping center. Faint 
and fading even as Gaul watched, a twin set of dark blue lines snaked from the parking lot to the road, then to the freeway's on-ramp. Show me that parking lot sixty seconds ago, Gaul said. Chapter 5 Dryden changed lanes to pass a semi, keeping the pickup just above the speed limit to avoid drawing attention. Visibility on the 101 was better than it had been in town. As the freeway followed the coast, it also climbed above the fog. For now, his goal was simply to put distance between themselves and El Cedero. He would decide on a destination after hearing the rest of Rachel's story. She'd been quiet for the past minute, contemplating how to tell it. Finally, she turned to him. Before I say anything, I need to do something, so you'll believe me, she said. There are men with machine guns after you. Whatever's going on, you don't need to convince me it's real. You might feel different after you've heard more of it. She looked down at her hands. They were drumming a pattern on her knees. Whatever she was about to do, it was making her nervous. This is going to weird you out, she said, just so you know. More than what's already happened tonight? Way more. She exhaled hard, and before Dryden could respond, she said, Think of a four-digit number, a random one, not part of your phone number or anything else someone might know. Don't say it out loud, just think of it. Clamp your lips together, too, so you don't accidentally mouth it. Dryden glanced at her, wondering if it was a joke. It wasn't. She was staring at him, anxiety running through her like an electric current. Dryden focused on the road again and went with it. He closed his mouth. He ignored numbers that meant anything to him. He let his mind spin up one that was purely random, 6,724. The idea of it had hardly formed when Rachel spoke again. 6,724. Dryden turned and stared at her. She stared back. The truck strayed onto the rumble strip, and he jerked the wheel back to the left and watched the road again. For a few seconds, he couldn't think of what to say. Never before had he encountered something unbelievable and undeniable at the same time. He glanced at her again. She was still watching him for his reaction. He faced forward and thought, Say antelope, if you're hearing this. Antelope, Rachel said. Curran accelerated to 90, veering through the light traffic on the freeway. They're four and a half miles ahead, Gall said over the cell phone. They're doing just about exactly the speed limit, so you'll catch up to them in a matter of minutes. Next exit is more than 20 miles out. Copy, Curran said, though he could tell Gall had already hung up. Working for Gall sometimes felt like working for God. The man's knowledge resources seemed to border on omnipotent, while remaining almost entirely shrouded. Also, he didn't want to piss him off. Curran wouldn't have been surprised to learn Gaul could turn people into salt pillars. You can just... read me? Dryden asked. He felt his mind trying to get a fix on all of it and not quite managing. Reading might be the wrong word, Rachel said. That makes it sound like I'm doing it on purpose. It's more like hearing. It just happens. I can't even shut it off. And you hear everything, every thought, every idea. Rachel nodded. As far as I know, sometimes it's confusing if I can't tell my own thoughts from someone else's. If I find myself thinking it would suck to get shot right now, it's hard to know if that's your thought or just mine. But most thoughts, yeah, I can tell they're yours. Then softer. I can tell you're a nice person, and that you like me, and that being with me reminds you of someone, and that makes you happy and sad at the same time. Tension crept into Dryden's mind. Would he have to censor his thoughts now? Every stupid random thing that leapt into his head? Could he even do that? Don't worry about it, Rachel said. It took a second for him to realize what had just happened. That she'd replied to something he hadn't even said aloud. Sorry, Rachel said. I can wait for you to actually say things if you like. For a long moment, Dryden said nothing. He watched the lines on the pavement sliding past. How do you do it? he asked. How does it work? I don't know. You've always been able to? For the past two months, at least. How long before that, I have no idea. In her own way, she sounded as confused as he felt. No doubt she was. I know it doesn't work over much distance, she said. If you ever need some privacy, a short walk would do it. The strange chill at Dryden's temples was still there. It hadn't faded at all since he'd first noticed it near the freeway. Now that he thought about it, he wondered if it had been there even before that, 
back in town, back on the boardwalk even, and the first moments after he'd encountered Rachel. The chill comes from me, she said. Whatever it is my brain does, that's what it feels like to the other person. The way she said it, quiet and vulnerable, apologetic. Dryden could almost read her thoughts. Don't think I'm a freak. Don't abandon me. Please. I barely feel it, Dryden said. Don't worry. She nodded, then drew her knees against her on the seat and hugged them. She seemed tiny, sitting there like that. Four minutes until they would overtake the pickup. Curran couldn't see its taillights yet through the rises and turns of the coast highway, but he'd done the math in his head. He looked over his shoulder at the van's middle bench seat, where three of his men sat with their weapons ready. He saw no pleasure in their expressions and felt none himself. The job needed doing, nothing more to it than that. Don't bother disabling the vehicle, Curran said. Start with kill shots. The girl first. The place they had me in was like a hospital, Rachel said. Except it was empty. There was just me and the people keeping me there. This was the place you were running from tonight? Rachel nodded. Dryden tried to picture it. El Sidero was a pretty small town. It was hard to envision anything like an abandoned hospital there. He thought of the district Rachel's pursuers had seemed to come from, the area just inland from the Dune Ridge. There was an office park over there, a hundred acres of well-kept grounds with an array of sprawling one- and two-story buildings. The kind of structures you could drive past every day for twenty years and never so much as think about. You could work in one of them and not have a clue what went on in the place next door. Those were the buildings, Rachel said. The one they had me in was off by itself, way in back. Dryden waited for her to go on. She still had her arms around her legs. She was staring ahead at the night rolling toward them. I woke up there two months ago, she said. I was strapped to a hospital bed. I didn't know where I was or who I was. A doctor with blonde hair would show up sometimes either to hook an IV to my arm or take one away. Other times different men would come in, the same ones who were chasing me tonight, and they'd untie my bed straps. Then they'd come in later and strap me down again. Nobody would ever speak to me, no matter how much I asked. Nobody would tell me what was happening to me, or why. Dryden felt his hands tighten on the steering wheel. Sometimes in the first few days, Rachel said, I noticed strange thoughts in my head. For a while I thought they were my memories coming back, but not for long. They were just too bizarre. They didn't seem like my own thoughts at all. Like... Some of them were a man's thoughts about his wife from his own point of view. These thoughts got a lot louder whenever the blonde man or the others came into the room, and then at some point I understood what I was really hearing. Dryden passed another semi. Ahead of it, the road lay empty and dark for a mile or more. Everything I know I got from their thoughts, Rachel said. The people in that building. It wasn't much. They hardly knew anything at all. They'd been assigned to keep me there, but they didn't know where I came from. They knew I could hear thoughts. They'd been warned about that, but no one had told them how I could do it, how I got this way. So, I don't know either. They must have known other things. Who they work for, the government, a company, something like that. It was hard to get anything like that from them. Most of the time they weren't close enough for me to hear them thinking. Even when they were, it almost never helped. You'd be surprised how scattered people's thoughts are. You hear little chunks of an argument they have with someone looping over and over. Probably stuff they wish they'd said. Sometimes you just hear a song in their head. You hardly ever hear important things about their lives, their name, their job, anything like that. Like, how often do you actually think of your own name? I guess I can see that. When people do focus their thoughts, they mostly think about what they don't know. What they're unsure of. So, with these guys, a lot of their questions were the same ones I had. Like, who I was where I came from, they didn't know. I did get the name of someone they work for, someone pretty powerful, I think. A man they thought of as Gaul. The name struck Dryden. He'd heard it before, though he couldn't quite place it. Someone at the top of one of the big defense contractors, he thought, way up in the overlap between corporate America and the government. That wasn't a world Dryden swam in himself, but he'd learned more about it than he cared to during his active years. The people in that building... Wondered about him a lot, Rachel said. They were always nervous about him, especially the blonde man. 
He's the one I mostly learn things from. He had a room down the hall from me, his office, I guess. He was in there a lot. Maybe he thought it was out of my range, but it wasn't. Not quite. What did you learn from him? Rachel shut her eyes. Dryden got the impression again that she was framing her thoughts, trying to put them in some order that would make sense. That they were supposed to get information from me. Things I know, things I knew, anyway, when I could remember. Dryden waited for her to continue. That's what the IV drugs were for, to make me talk in my sleep. Only it was more than that. The drugs were supposed to make it so I could have conversations in my sleep. Someone could ask me questions and I'd answer, like if I was hypnotized, I think. My memory problems come from the drugs, too. The way the blonde man understood it, that was a side effect that only kicked in while I was awake. When I was asleep, talking in my sleep, I could still remember what I knew. She breathed out softly. Dryden heard emotion in the sound of it. An edge of fear, for some reason. Did you find out after a while what they'd gotten from you? Dryden asked. Did you hear it in the blonde guy's thoughts? Rachel shook her head. It was never them questioning me. What I heard in his thoughts was that he and the others always had to leave the building as soon as the drugs knocked me out, and that other people would be coming in to question me. Those people would always be gone before I woke up. The blonde man and the others had no idea who they were, never even saw them so I had no way of knowing what I'd said in my sleep. She was quiet for a second. I guess that sounds pretty strange to you. Dryden watched the highway. What Rachel had said didn't sound strange at all. Dryden could name three different narcotic agents that had the effects she'd described. He'd seen each of them used on people time and again. All three carried the side effect Rachel now suffered, a roadblock in the memory usually lodged right at the point when the drugs were first administered. Rachel turned to him. He glanced at her and saw her eyebrows knit toward each other, confusion at what she'd just heard in his thoughts. There's a lot about me I'll have to explain to you sometime, Dryden said, if you want to know. She nodded and faced forward again. This information they were trying to get from you, Dryden said, it sounds like it scares you. Rachel nodded again and Dryden heard the same tremor in her breath he'd heard before. Why are you afraid of it? he asked. Because they were afraid. The blonde man and the others there, the soldiers. They didn't know anything themselves, but they knew other people who had some of the details. Other people who worked for Gaul higher up. And whatever the information is that's in my head, those people are terrified of it. They're scared the way people get when it comes to really big things, like diseases, like wars. It's like there's something coming. The chill in the girl's voice seemed to radiate into Dryden's bones. That's it, Rachel said. That's all I know about it, and I'm scared. Before Dryden could ask anything else, a new set of headlights appeared in the mirror, far back along the freeway. The newcomer changed lanes to pass another vehicle, moving fast. Rachel reacted either to Dryden's sudden alertness or to the thoughts beneath it. She turned and leaned forward and looked into the passenger side mirror. Dryden kept his eyes on his own mirror, watching the road ahead only as much as he had to. The new arrival slipped through the headlights of the vehicle that had passed, becoming a silhouette for a fleeting moment. It looked like a van. Gaul watched the F-150, its engine compartment and cab lit up in ghostly blue-white thermal, from three separate viewing angles. A fourth Miranda had a wider view, which included the van containing Kern and the team. The van was closing distance easily, and there was no sign that Sam Dryden had spotted the pursuers. The pickup maintained its speed. Gaul's cell phone rang. It was Hollings, the man he'd assigned to dig into the classified part of Dryden's background. Gaul ignored the call. Nothing in the world mattered right now as much as the drama about to unfold on these monitors, hopefully with brutal speed and efficiency. Dryden was a well-trained soldier, but all the training in the world couldn't counter the odds he faced. Curran and his team were six men with state-of-the-art weapons and training, and the element of surprise. The van closed to within 500 yards. There was no escape. The cell phone quit ringing. 
Dryden watched the van close in. It had slowed a bit after first appearing, maybe to keep from standing out, but had still halved its distance in the past 60 seconds. How did they find us? Rachel asked. Dryden thought of the unformed suspicion he'd felt earlier when he was listening for a helicopter. Now it took shape fully in his mind. He'd overlooked the answer initially. He hadn't known that anyone as powerful as Gaul was involved. They're using a satellite, he said. Maybe more than one. He sorted through the implications of that fact, trying to stay rational even as the van closed in. Depending on how good Gaul's birds were, he and his techs might be able to watch the entire conflict that was about to unfold. In that case, it would be no use stopping and fleeing on foot into the hills. Thermal satellite cameras would easily follow them, and Gaul could direct his men on the ground accordingly. In fact, any kind of escape would be pointless as long as the pursuers were in any shape to follow. That left a limited range of options, none of them friendly. Dryden felt old mental tricks coming back to him, ways of keeping his pulse down and his mind cold. The sensation was strangely pleasant, like the bass rhythm of a song not heard in years. I'm getting a reassuring vibe from you, Rachel said, but I have to wonder why you're still going the speed limit. It keeps them thinking surprise is on their side, Dryden said. Which means it's really on ours. Ahead loomed yet another semi. There would be just enough time to pass it before the van caught up, and that was going to be critical, because Dryden suddenly understood what he had to do. The road was perfect for it. Two lanes bordered on the left by a concrete median divider and on the right by a guardrail and then a 45-degree drop to the sea. No shoulder on either side. The freeway might as well have been the Lincoln Tunnel. Exactly what he needed. He glanced at Rachel. You already know my plan, don't you? He said. I think so, she said. She gripped the armrest on the passenger door, bracing for things to get rough. Dryden risked a slight increase in speed to pass the semi, even using his turn signal when he changed lanes. Behind them, the van changed lanes too, and began the final push to close the gap. Gaul leaned in toward the nearest monitor. All the night's stress and anxiety would end within the minute right there in a pixelated blaze. At that moment, footsteps came sprinting down the corridor outside, and a technician appeared in the doorway with a cordless phone. Sir, the man said, it's Hollings. He says it's critical. Keeping his eyes on the monitor, Gaul took the phone from the tech. Can it wait thirty seconds? Gaul said into the phone. I'm not sure it can, sir, Hollings said. I tried calling your cell, but I couldn't get through. You're wasting seconds now, just tell me, Gaul said. I have part of Sam Dryden's restricted file. He is significantly more advanced than Delta. If Kern's men are still pursuing him, they need to be told. What did Dryden do after Delta? Gaul asked. A federal program called Ferret. It might have been under Homeland. I'm still trying to figure that out. What sort of work did he do in Ferret? The only thing Ferret does at all. Extraordinary rendition. The two words seeped into Gaul like winter drafts. His eyes went to the monitors again. The pickup cruising along at the speed limit. The man at the wheel carrying six years' experience in abducting people for the United States government. Six years honing a skill set that would include violent conflict in every possible civilian environment. Gaul's focus went to the van, closing fast on the truck, and he saw the absurdity that had been right in front of him for minutes. There was essentially zero chance a man like Sam Dryden would fail to spot trouble on his tail. Gaul dropped the cordless unit and grabbed his cell phone in the same movement. Chapter 6 Curran watched the F-150 slip past the nose of the semi ahead. He could see Dryden and the girl in silhouette above the pickup seat back. When he gets back in the right lane, Curran said, I'll stay in the left and come up just shy of passing, clear to fire when I say go. The three shooters on the bench seat took position. A fourth prepared to slide open the door. Curran's cell rang. Gall. He reached to answer it, then simply ignored it. Taking his attention off the action now would be the wrong move. Ahead, Dryden merged back into the right lane. Curran accelerated along the length of the semi and beyond it. He would overtake the pickup in less than ten seconds. The man at the side door slid it open. Wind roared into the vehicle. The shooters brought their MP5s to the ready. In the last moments before it would all go down... Curran found himself wondering how a man like Sam Dryden, a former Delta operator not to mention whatever the hell he'd been for those six black years, could end up this naive. 
Then Dryden did something strange. He put the truck's turn signal back on and merged once more to the left, though there was nothing ahead of him to pass. The pickup was directly in front of the van again. What the fuck is this? Curran said. Dryden watched the van and the semi in his rearview mirror. The timing was going to come down to tenths of a second, so there was no way to be that exact in the execution. This was going to be messy as hell. Beside him, Rachel pulled her seatbelt tight. The van was behind the pickup, a single car length from its tailgate. The semi was another two lengths behind the van, in the next lane. Close enough for government work, Dryden said, and slammed his heel on the brake. The effect was all he could have asked for. At freeway speed, the van's driver had nowhere near the time or space he needed to react. There was no place for him to go but the open lane to the right, directly in front of the semi. The van swerved hard for it, missing the pickup's back end by inches. In the same instant, Dryden took his foot off the brake. His speed had dropped to 40. When the van passed the pickup's back end, Dryden veered right as well, ramming the van's nose from the side and sending it into the guardrail at an angle. At more than 70 miles per hour. All that was left was the physics. Mass, momentum, friction, velocity, no forgiveness in any of it. The van's front end dug into the guardrail and its tail swung outward. It spun more than 360 degrees and then its tires got a grip on the pavement when the vehicle was more or less sideways, pitching it into a tumble along the freeway. In the mirror, Dryden saw at least two bodies thrown from the vehicle from what looked like an open side door. All of this had happened within three seconds of Dryden hitting the brakes. For those same three seconds, the driver of the semi had been trying to stop, unsuccessfully. The semi plowed into the tumbling van and partially rolled up over it, finally grinding both the van and the semi to a stop in a shower of sparks. The van, which had ruptured its fuel tank at some point during its acrobatics, was ablaze by the time it slid to a halt. Dryden stopped the pickup fifty yards beyond the wreckage. He stepped out into the freeway and looked back. He saw the semi-driver open his door, drop to the pavement, and run like hell, no doubt expecting the van to go off like a bomb. But the van's fuel was mostly spread along the freeway, and what remained in the tank was already burning. Dryden squinted into the glare and saw the van's occupants trapped inside, fully engulfed. The two who'd been thrown lay far from the wreck on the asphalt. It was possible they were alive. It was not possible they would be of any use to Gaul in the near future if ever again. Dryden got back in the truck. He found Rachel staring at him, scared, her eyes huge. I'm sorry that had to happen, Dryden said. He considered saying more in the way of justifying it, but didn't. She wasn't stupid, and in any case it was time to get going. Without a doubt, Gaul was already sending whatever else he could mobilize, probably something with wings or rotors this time. The only way to survive the next hour was to lose the satellites though at the moment Dryden had no idea how he was going to do that. Whatever he came up with, it would take time to do it, and there was no telling how long they really had. He put the truck in gear and got moving. He pushed it up to eighty this time, the fastest he could go without risking a blown cylinder. He glanced at Rachel. She was staring straight ahead, her eyes rimmed with tears. She wiped at them and said, I don't mean to make you feel bad. You protected me and there was no other way. I understand that. What I'm crying about is weird and stupid. It's just me. If you want to talk about it, you can. For a moment, she said nothing. Then, when you hit them from the side in that little bit of time afterward, before they hit the guardrail, they were close enough that I could read them all. And right before they hit, they all knew they were going to die. Going that fast and suddenly out of control like that, they just knew it was every bad feeling at the same time. All the hardness about them was gone, all the training, everything... There was nothing but fear in knowing they were dead. Dryden saw her turn to him. I loved it, she said. I loved that it was that bad for them. I thought, this is what you get. I hope it hurts. I felt all that for about a second, and then it hit me. How bad it was to think something like that, and I just lost it. She wiped at her eyes again. She looked miserable. If anyone in this world has earned a little vindictiveness, Dryden said, it's you. It still doesn't feel right. She rested her head on her knees. You need me to stop talking for a while, she said. You need time to think. Dryden nodded. I need time to think.